This is another episode of The Godless Antitheist. The Truth About Life You know, Christians are so arrogant, they think they're God's gift to the universe. They think they're God's gift to life. But the truth of the matter is, people, is that life couldn't give a fuck about you and me. Life couldn't give a fuck about you and me. People, there's some people in this world who just won't accept reality. I'm sure that the dinosaurs thought that they were the tops of life. That life was meant for them. But they got a rude awakening. The dinosaurs went away. They went extinct. I'm sure the dodo bird thought it was pretty special in life. But it went extinct. Thousands upon thousands of life forms have went extinct. Life doesn't give a fuck about a particular species. And life doesn't give a fuck about the human species. And if we don't care if we don't take care of our environment so that we can live here, and if we don't take care of our place in the universe, life won't give a fuck if human beings disappear. We're just another species. And life will go on. And I think that pisses Christians off the most. The fact that they're going to die and life is going to continue without them. So sad. You know, I think it is so sad that some people just can't stand it. That they're going to die just like everybody else. So they invent this mythology, this imaginary friend of theirs that's going to promise them eternal life and that's all it is is a promise you know there's there's no proof that there's eternal life for anybody when there is verifiable evidence for eternal life then we could start planning for it maybe yeah once we found out what it was but there's no evidence that you or I uh, go on and on and on and on and on you know, it's like if if you've ever seen a mushroom, you you see that mushroom. I, I love mushrooms, especially morel mushrooms. And the mushroom on top of the ground is not the mushroom. Let me explain. The mushroom that you pick off the ground is the fruit of the mushroom it's the mushroom fruit the mushroom is underground it's a network of a mushroom being when you pick that mushroom you're not killing the mushroom colony the mu mushroom being it's just the fruit of the mushroom that you're eating you're not eating the mushroom Maybe this example will help you. When you come upon an apple tree and you pick the apple off the tree, you're not eating the tree, you're eating the fruit. And that's what animals are. We are the fruit of life. And when we are picked off of the fruit, uh, uh, if we, when we are picked from life, life doesn't die. We do, just like when you pick that apple off the apple tree and eat that apple, the tree's still there. <clears throat> just like when you pick a mushroom off the gra uh, from the ground where it's been growing, you don't kill the mushroom. You're just eating the fruit. And when you, you die, life goes on. You are the fruit. And what you, 
what does that mean? Does that mean we don't have to care about each other? We don't have to share with each other? We don't have to empathize with each other? Let's say we had a thousand years to live. What's that got to do with how we treat each other? How we arrange our society? How, how we interact with each other? Life is for the living. Not for the dead. And you should be, in my opinion even more concerned about how you conduct yourself with the limited time you have. You know, I say limited. If you live, and I live to be a hundred, which, you know, who knows how many of our later years would be worth living anyway. But dogs, what, they live about 10 years? Maybe 13 years? I know cats have a short lifespan. Uh, our cat is 12 years old and the reason she has made it to 12 years old is she's domesticated we feed her we shelter her she's had many diseases that would have killed her had we not taken her to the vet she'd have been dead a long time ago but we are we are keeping her we have adopted her into our family I don't even like the word pets because a, it, she's not property. She's a living being that we have allowed into our home. It's like adopting a, ch a human, a child, human being. I, I'm not her master. I am simply have simply adopted her into the family. My wife and I have adopted her. She's part of the family, and we. And as a member of the family, she gets health care, she gets food, she gets water, she gets shelter. And she would have died of common cat diseases had we not intervened and took her to the vet. She doesn't like going to the vet. As a matter of fact, if she sees her cat carrier before we've caught her, <laughs> she'll run. She'll run you ragged because she sees the carrier, the cat carrier, and she knows she's going to the vet and she doesn't want to go. But if she didn't go to the vet, didn't get the medication, she'd have been dead a long time ago. She's had several uh, bite marks from other cats, you know, she's uh, injured herself. Because we let her outside. She's an indoor, outdoor cat. We don't keep her in the house exclusively. So she's out in the wild. And subject to all the things that cats are subject to in the wild. So she's 12 years old. And that's very old for a cat. A, a dog that's. Ten years old is very old for a dog. For the same reason, in the wild, things happen. And they don't have the medicine that we human beings do. And as human beings, one of the good things we have done is we have developed medicine, not only for ourselves, but for our animals that we've adopted into our families. We can extend their lives simply by veterinary care. Wow. And I'm not, I don't know if a cat worries about how long it's going to live. It, it, it lives. It lives as best it can. It interacts with other cats as best it can in their cat nature. And you and I, even though we may only live a hundred years, we sure, we surely, surely in, in, in our being, we don't say to ourselves, well, I'm only going to live to be 80, so I'm going to uh, go around killing people. Or I'm going to go around uh, cutting people's he uh, arms off. Or I'm going to be going around shooting people and wounding them. Or I'm going to go around cutting people's legs off. Just because I'm not going to live forever. 
And there's no heaven, no reward, and there's no hell, there's no punishment. What, what kind of sick human being thinks that way? I, I'm not nice to you, and you're not, you shouldn't be nice to me because you think you're going to get a reward. That's selfish. I'm nice to you because that's the way I want to be as a human being. Now, will I come uh, and become your worst nightmare, your worst enemy? If I think you've fucked me over, sure, I'm a human being. I'm nice to you, and I expect to be treated with respect as well. I'm, I'll re treat you with respect, and I expect to be treated with respect. I do not like the Christian religion, superstition, but as a human being I don't walk up to people and say are you a Christian and then write them off I have many people that are my friends are my neighbors are my co-workers are people I deal with every day and I deal with them in the nicest manner I can and I know and I I know that most likely the people that I meet in, in especially in the United States are Christians And that doesn't make any difference to the way I want to treat people. Now, like I say, I can be someone's worst enemy. And if a Christian, if I meet a Christian, hi, how are you? Let's talk about technology or let's talk about gardening or let's talk about this or that or the weather, you know. But then in the conversation they start talking about their imaginary god to me and their imaginary religion their superstition and start advocating and demanding that i too worship their god their imaginary god then we're going to have trouble but i'm not walking up to somebody and say are you a christian and they say yes and i say fuck you no if you start imposing your worldview onto me and start telling me that I'm devil possessed if you start telling me I'm an evil person for being an atheist if you tell me I'm going to hell if you start ranting and raving about that we have a problem just like if I'm talking to you trying to be friendly to you trying to be nice to you and for some reason you just go off you're a piece of shit. You're no good. You're blah, blah, blah. <laughs> no human being is going to put up with that. We're going to have a problem. Just as I'm sure if I walked up to you and I said, are you a Christian? And you said yes. And I said, well, you're an evil person. You're wrong. You're not. I can't be your friend. You're so stupid. Now, do I do videos where I say Christianity is a superstition? Christianity is stupid? Yes, but I'm, I'm talking about the belief. And I have a right to address the belief. But I'm not going to walk up to you, ask you if you're a Christian, and then start attacking you and your Christianity. If you ask me, or if the conversation turns to it, in other words, uh, many people, when, when they meet me for the first time or into the, uh, the getting to know each other, let's say the first time I meet you, uh, we're, we're talking friendly, we're talking about the weather, we're talking this, we're talking that. We don't get into deep subjects. Might talk sports, whatever. It's a general getting to know each other. But after a couple of uh, days of getting to know each other suddenly you say what church do you go to this I get this a lot what church do you go to I don't go to church I'm an atheist <gasps> what you're the only atheist I've ever met and I say I'm not the only atheist you've ever met I'd say about 80 percent of the people in church are atheists you've just met the first atheist that will admit it 
I'm out of the closet, as they say. So I'm not really the first atheist you've met. I'm just the first atheist that said it to your face and out in the open. I'm an open atheist. If you know me for any a length of time, you're going to find out that I'm an atheist. Because the subject of God always comes up. It doesn't stay uh, unmentioned for very long. If you meet somebody, you know, like I say, most of the time, after you've met somebody two or three ten times, they'll either say, yeah, I was at church the other day. They interject their religion into the conversation somehow because they're obligated to do that. They're looking for indoc to indoctrinate as many people as they can. It's part of their superstition to indoctrinate more people, to get more people to come to their church. You know, you go to their church, then they tell you, well, now you are you can be a member of our church. Now you got to do donate 10% of everything, all your labor, to the church. One of the reasons they want you, new members. New members, more money. More money, they can do other things. More things. They can start something new or they can continue to do uh, more of what they were doing. So it's it's a lot of it's money and, of course, the more people that they can get to believe their, to their way, it's kind of trying to confirm that, well, there's a billion Christians in the world, so a billion people can't be wrong. Well, there's seven billion people in the world, huh? And only one billion are Christians. So there's six billion people that aren't Christian. So can six billion people be wrong? So, you know, this crazy idea that when the apple falls from the tree and rots on the ground and maybe the, some of the seeds inside that apple begin to grow and, a, and another apple tree is growing, that apple that fell from the tree or that apple that you picked and ate is gone. It's gone. That apple is no more. The energy and resources of that apple will be broken down and reused as ingredients for the next thing. The next year, the, the apples fall from the tree. It's, it's fall. All the apples fall from the tree. And the next year, the apple flowers come out. They get pollinated. And for every pollinated flower, there comes a apple that will grow through the season. But that apple may even look like the apple on that branch from last year. But it's not that apple. It's a different apple, a completely different apple. It's not the same apple. So you have an opportunity to be good, for goodness sake, in this life that you have. Why botch it up? Why be evil? Why do bad things to other people? Why spend your life doing that even if you aren't going to be alive in a hundred years you know it used to be when I was 20 and I saw a 10 year old I thought well when that 10 year old is 20 I'll be 30 and when that 10 year that 20 year old is 30 I'll be 40 but there comes a time and I've reached that time when I see a, uh, we have a uh, a niece who just turned five years old. She's five years old. I'm 62. Do the math. When she's 62, I will be long gone. No more. No more John. Never more John. 
And why doesn't that scare me? Because I was born in February. I'm going to be 62 soon. I was born in February 1952. In 1930, I didn't exist. I wasn't even, my parents weren't even thinking about me. Didn't know they were going to have a boy. And that boy was going to be me. Didn't know it. I could have easily never been born. 1830. I wasn't around. I didn't exist. 1730. I wasn't around. I didn't exist. So today, at 62... I'm going to be 62 in a couple of days, so I just might as well embrace it, right? As being 62, and I'm on the other side of the hill, I'm on the downside of the hill of life. You know, I'm not 10 years old anymore. I'm not 30 years old anymore. I'm, uh, my life, i got more life behind me than I've got ahead of me basically. What, should I kill myself? No. Life is worth living. And even if it's limited life, you can make a difference in someone else's life. You can make a difference by being a good person. Just being a good person. So if you want to know What's my purpose in life? Oh my goodness. Being a good person. You're a, Oh, I, I want to be part of something bigger than myself. You're a part of the fucking human race. You are part of the solar system. You are part of the galaxy. You are part of the universe. You're already part of something bigger than yourself. You are part of life. Life is bigger than we are. Life goes on after we're dead and before we're alive. The people in the 1500s were living their lives, loving each other, having children, loving them chi their children, loving their grandchildren, and so on and so on through the generations. The people of 1776 had no idea about me because I wasn't a poss I was only a possibility. I, I wasn't guaranteed to be here. You know, there's a uh, what a million sperm, one egg, and out of that million sperm, the sperm that was uh, eventually to be me won the race and uh, fertilized the egg. So life was living before I was uh, ever existed. And when I don't exist again, life's going to go on. Uh, people, it's 2014, so 2014 years from now, there's going to be a person living their life, hopefully, if, if the human race survives, then in 4,014, people will be living their lives, enjoying their lives. And who knows, maybe we will be uh, eternal by then. Maybe science will figure it out how to, how to keep us all alive. And we'll populate the universe that way. But right now, this is what we got. And we need to care and share, have empathy, compassion, not just to each other, but to our the animals that we adopt, the, the environment. We need to be nice to the environment because, you know, you cut down a tree, you cut down too many trees, and we won't have any oxygen to live. So it's in our best interest that we are nice to other things. 
And though you and I don't know who is going to be living in in uh, 4014, it will be nice to know and good to know. And I'm always up up to no good. It would be good to know that you and I didn't cause harm to those yet to be born and those that are born today. My niece, who's five years old, I'll be gone by the time she's 62, the age I am now. But that doesn't mean I should be cruel to her. That doesn't mean I should pull her hair and kick her. She's life. Living. I hope she has a good life. I hope when she's 62, we will have solved this death problem and she will live forever. I wish it would happen tomorrow. But if it doesn't happen for me, maybe it'll happen for this five-year-old niece of ours. And even though I have, and my wife has, and we all have, a limited time to be alive, that's no excuse to treat my five-year-old niece badly. She deserves to be treated with compassion, with love, with understanding, with cooperation, share with her. Being a finite person and having a finite life is no reason to do bad and to be bad to other people, other animals, the environment, uh, to anything. We need to love one another. That is a good reason to be alive. Till next time, thank you for watching The Godless Antitheist. Because you don't need an imaginary friend to be loving to one another. I hope you will love one another. Till next time. Thank you for watching.